So we're going to dive into a conversation about the realities and ideas about adopting AI in, in wealth tech and wealth management. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be joined by some, some experts in the field um, who are going to, I think, add a lot of colour uh, to this subject matter. So I'll ask, um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Charlotte, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So, hi, I'm Charlotte Wood. I head up the innovation and fintech team at Schroders. Um, so, I actually work group-wide, so covering our asset management business as well as wealth. Um, but in our role, we're looking at emerging technologies and the impact of emerging technologies uh, on our industry, where we can leverage it, um, and also what companies are working in the space that we might be able to partner with. Um, so when ChatGPT sort of came onto the scene at the end of last year and, and caused a lot of excitement, that fell kind of squarely into my area. So um, we've been working to kind of bring specifically kind of large language models into Schroders um, and start using it in different parts of the, of the company, including wealth. Great, thanks. And Mohammed? Uh, yeah, so uh, Mo Marika, uh, work for the Royal Bank of Canada. I uh, have two roles, uh, but only one salary, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the first is um, uh, artificial intelligence research, where, which we conduct uh, in the UK in partnership with Imperial College London and the University of Southampton. And the second half is putting that into practice in, within the firm, and I run a small digital engineering team split between here and Canada. Thanks. Um, before we dive into some of the questions, um, a reminder that um, please do ask questions via the app uh, through this Q&A. Um, we've got some questions um, that we're going to be asking, but I'm very keen to get um, questions from the room um, asked, uh, asked as well to the, to the experts. Um, so to kick off with, a, with quite a big question, I suppose, um, where, are the, where are the opportunities for, for AI and wealth management? Where, where do you guys think is the most significant impact? Mike, we'll start with you. I think the, the most significant area is actually developer productivity. So uh, when we look at the cost of implementing some massive digitization programs, a, a lot of the resourcing there is development resourcing. And you know, banks in general have been quite quite slow in adopting AI tools, and I think it's pretty much across the sector. Tools like GitHub Copilot, for example, are not permitted. But I think this is where you sort you see some of the fintechs moving ahead here, because there is a huge the the pace at which you can develop is accelerated massively by using these tools. Um, so that's on the the actual kind of development side. On the operational side, it makes it far much more, uh, again, kind of compresses the development time frame uh, for automating processes where, because um, what you often find in banking is that you'll have plenty of processes which are not actually written down, right? They exist in people's minds and there's some broad frameworks written down somewhere in a policy document. So what you need is a system that can uh, essentially observe people's behavior, learn what they're doing, um, and you know, AI allows you to then uh, gives you the ability to kind of simulate those human behaviours without the the kind of the cost and effort it would have taken before. Uh, interesting, Charlotte. Yeah, I guess my my perspective. Um, we first went and spoke to our senior leadership kind of across the business at the beginning of this year to understand where they saw the opportunities in their parts of the business. So, you know, we were talking to our, our legal team, our wealth team, our sales, marketing, investment. Um, and what was really amazing about this is that they all had ideas um, and quite strong views on how they saw this technology kind of transforming their part of the company. Um, I think there's definitely uh, like a time frame difference on some some of the areas where where the opportunities are. Um, I think exactly to your point, um, like developer productivity is a huge one, um, and the ability for this to help with development is kind of an immediate um, use case that we're seeing a lot um, for our own internal AI tools. And actually, we do we use GitHub Copilot as well. Our biggest adoption has been in the technology team and in the marketing team. So I think marketing has been a huge area that where we've seen significant 
gains already if you think about things like translation and the work you know we're a global company we do so much translation all over the world um, and the workflows um, for doing that are, are quite significant but we're already seeing a lot of benefits from kind of deploying AI into that area um, and actually our, our marketing team in kind of helping them to draft content or take content that's already been written and repurposing it for other other things and making the most of the thought leadership that we have throughout the company that's been kind of immediately really beneficial we've seen really high adoption from those groups um, but I actually think I think the opportunity is across the whole of our organization um, and for wealth I think there are there are two quite exciting areas one is kind of the actual interaction with customers and the opportunity there of being able to hopefully actually personalize a lot of those interactions and take information that at the moment can be quite generic it can be quite sort of difficult for somebody to understand from kind of what does this mean for me and using AI to turn that into something that is a lot more tangible um, and then on the investment side I think the ability of us to to extract information um, from unstructured data so for example sustainability is a huge area but there's so much information out there and it, a lot of it's unstructured and it it takes ages to kind of analyze all of that the ability of, of large language models to extract insights from information at scale um, we think is a really exciting opportunity too just to expand upon a, a point you've both made and charlotte you mentioned that a lot of parts of the, the, the enterprise had very firm opinions about where they could best see it. And then thinking about what Mo, you said about understanding processes because things in banks are often often not written down. I've lived that reality and it was, it was tough. I mean, is there scope to use AI to understand where the opportunities are in of itself? Yeah, I think there's... There's, that's a really interesting point because there's definitely something there around the amount of information that our organisation, I'm sure it's the same for you, the amount of information that we have that currently is not accessible because it's in people's inboxes, it's in different areas of the, of the company and actually being able to kind of understand um, where there is data that could be you know, having much better use made of it. Um, is really important and that's I think data you know, when you talk about AI data strategy has to be part of how you are talking about AI too because it, being able to deploy AI as an organization is only going to be as good as how good you are at making data available um, to solve your business challenges um, I was gonna make another point but I can't remember what it was <laughs> um, I would add the um I guess another really interesting use is also being able to look at um, patterns over large periods of time. So in the wealth management sector in, in particular, we have this challenge where we are expected to be able to uh, spot suspicious activity. Uh, and we're not talking about kind of, you know, a regular fraud sort of cases, but kind of tax evasion that's usually very well advised and very well planned because they're carried out by high net worth individuals, right? And usually, uh, you know, most of our pr uh, processes, and I think this, this is the case for any bank, will always be catching up with sort of the latest techniques out there. Um, and, you know, the, um, so sometimes somebody, even the simpler machine learning techniques can help us spot things that humans simply wouldn't have spotted before because you can't hold three years of transaction history in your mind if a client is doing a thousand transactions a day. Right? So I think there's a, there's a lot of power in, in even the kind of the, the small pieces. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, just thinking about um, already some of the questions in previous uh, um, speaker slots, but when everyone's thinking about AI, they, they are thinking about ethics uh, and what does that mean. So, um, do you do you have a sense um, within your firms and in, in your in your day to day? Are you thinking about and what are you thinking about the ethical and, and regulatory risks of, of AI and what that might mean for how, how your firms operate? Yeah, so we're, we're thinking about that really carefully. I mean, you know, as I'm sure a lot of people in this room are, we're a highly regulated company and our trust and our reputation is, is paramount. Um, and this is a learning, 
learning curve for us as much as it is for everyone else. So we are being cautious. Um, we have we have a responsible AI working group that has representation from different parts of our company, but including you know legal, compliance, risk, um, and information security, um, kind of at the top level of the company to come together and talk about these sorts of issues in in terms of how are we using AI, what are the potential risks, how are we going to mitigate those risks. Um, and actually often it comes down to kind of two things, is what, you know, what data are we trying to use and you know, what, what's the kind of can risk level of that data. So for example, like our client data or our employee data is that kind of top level. Um, so if there's anything that we were going to try and do with that, um, you know, it really needs a lot of scrutiny. Um, whereas also we deal with a lot of kind of publicly available information, so then maybe we can be a bit more permissive about what we do with that. Um, and then the other thing is, what are we doing with the output of the model? Like how are we ensuring that there is human review? How are we making sure that the people who are receiving the output of the model understand some of the kind of limitations of the technology um, and they know that you, know, you maybe can't entirely trust what it's telling you, you are responsible for verifying it. You can't kind of delegate that responsibility to AI. Um, so they're kind of the two main things that we end up talking about. But yeah, it's a, it's definitely getting a lot of focus um, in terms of that kind of responsible AI perspective. Thanks. Um, it was to touch on that last point, I think it's a really important one because uh, in all, having kind of done automation for a while before sort of falling into AI, it's I found it really scary how quickly teams can lose skills and knowledge after a process is automated. So, you know, while kind of in theory there's an expectation that there will be some human review, we have to be kind of really careful to ensure that human review is truly there, right? Um, I forget who was it that said, like, the, um, the AI dystopia, it's not Terminator, it's getting your account closed and there being no human uh, person to appeal to, right? Um, so I think, um, um, yeah, the other thing I guess following on from that when it comes to kind of the ethics conversation, um, I think a lot of you in the room, if you're, um, uh, if, you, if you're part of the compliance team, you probably would have um, received a request from the FCA in the last few weeks talk, um, asking about the use of AI within your firms. Um, but until we, I guess we have, um, you know, I guess we're going through this information gathering stage at the moment, but until we're at that, st uh, until we have kind of more specific regulation around AI, I, I think the um, kind of looking at outcomes is actually pretty instructive. And, you know, this, the same uh, way that we dealt with kind of automated credit decisioning and things in the past, right? And what we often find is the risk isn't in implementing an algorithm to make a particular decision, it's ultimately where the human involvement is and whether a system takes over a process entirely or if there is some, or if it's part of a process and it's providing a suggestion or a recommendation to someone. And then the context in which that recommendation or suggestion is provided. So is someone seeing that recommendation as an instruction or are they seeing it as a, a fallible system uh, you know, what we, what I'd often mentioned to my colleagues is when you see, um, so when we've implemented a, like kind of an AI system that provides suggestions into a process, I said, you've got to treat this like it's an intern, right? It's only been learning here for three or four months. It will get things wrong. Do not, it might sound really convincing, but you can't treat it like an expert, right? But this does need, you kind of have to over communicate these messages because what happens, you know, as it is, with, with, with a human relationship. If somebody gets things right for two years in a row, you, you're probably going to think that person's pretty good and you know, you'll trust them with bigger things. You can't <laughs> do that with AI, right? You've got to keep auditing to make sure because um, especially you know, in the old automation days, you know, we could audit the code. We could hire an external party to kind of give us uh, an assurance that the code follows a particular process that we've set out. That's not the case with ML. All you can do is just sample test. And I, su I suppose th th this really expands upon what you've both been, been referencing and that idea of accountability and repeatedly explaining to, to people, to teams, to functions that you are still accountable. You cannot trust that, trust that tool. How, how do you see that 
How do you see that evolving, um, the accountability aspect of it? It's, I think it's one for the, it's really one for the executives because what you often find, particularly in, in, you know, as margins are getting more and more compressed in our sector, we've seen, you know, they've only gone one way over the past decade, right? So the expectation uh, of all technology teams is that we bring a system in and cost has to be then taken out. You know, it beds in three, four months. Okay, where, where does the cost come out? That's that's always the, the, the next question from, from our executives, right? So this, this makes the, the accountability question sometimes a lot more challenging because you then have to, um, you have to be very uh, clear on uh, what new risks you're creating. And then you also, you have to make sure that you've kind of got like an honest assessment of what true saving you have reached after you have implemented something. So you've not, you know, <laughs> saved 5FD in one place, but created, you know, this huge risk that then requires 5FD to monitor, right? So people often see the first stage, but not the second. Yeah. and I. <laughs> I guess this is to kind of draw a distinction between different types of AI as well. Um, like we've had machine learning models within Schroders for years, um, particularly in part of our you know, parts of our investment process, particularly in the quant teams. So you know, we have a pretty robust model governance process that looks at you know what's the model doing, how are we ensuring that it's, you know, the data is reliable, all, all that you know, really good governance around it, um, which means that in some areas, you know, basically kind of some element of decision making is is then kind of increasingly um, can be done by AI. But with this AI, with LLMs, which you know, chat GPT being one type of large language model, this sort of technology, which which my team is looking at bringing into, into Schroders, I think we are not at the point where we're delegating decision making to these. Um, everything that we're deploying or testing has a human in the loop um, while we kind of increase our understanding of, of the tech. And um, yeah, for example, if we have a, a prototype of, of something that can help answer common client questions, yeah, that's, that's great. We've got a client service team at the moment. They're answering inbound questions from, from clients that they have to go and look at you know, our data, external data, we can build a, something to help help them answer those questions. It'll generate a draft that then they can review, send to the client. Great. The natural evolution of that is, well, could you just have an interface for the client to go and ask those questions? And that may or may not be where things are heading, but we're, we're nowhere near the level of comfort that we would have to be at to give our clients access to interacting with the model directly and you know, having to trust that information. Um, so yeah, I think accountability will shift, but we personally at Schroders, we've got a lot of, um, of learning and testing to do before we are comfortable with that shift. Thank, thanks, Charlotte. I, I think what, what's interesting about this, and many of the people in this room will have used open AI's chat GPT and asked it questions for fun. Um, and some of the answers it comes back with make sense. Some of them don't. And a key thing that I think about is the data that goes into these models as well. Um, because what the model does is aggregate things. And if it's bad data in, you're going to get bad answers out. So it's how you think about structuring your, your data. I, I was just wondering, just going back to the, the outcomes element of this and accountability, fairness, and, and thinking about client safety, so to speak. Do, do you see any impact on that um, in the use of AI versus the, the current regulatory framework? You know, with consumer duty just come in. Do you see any changes to that or how that might work? I don't think it, um, because I guess if you look at it from an outcomes perspective, I don't think the use of technology actually changes things here, right? I think what it potentially does is it might exacerbate uh, risks for firms where, you know, if you've got a process that was happening manually or semi-manually, you, your, um, your uh, 
the likelihood, of, or I guess the, the total number of mistakes is constrained by your human capacity in your operations or client services team, right? If you fully hand over a process to a system, then potentially the, the number of mistakes you can then make is unconstrained, and then the financial risks and, and regulatory risks that create could, could get out of hand unless you have a model risk governance process, right? Um, but I think, you know, I, I think we, we might be getting, um, with a lot of these things, again, it all, it all comes down to how it's implemented. And I think often, you know, it's, it's usually more than instructive to look at the outcomes versus getting bogged down in the detail of what the system's actually doing. Okay, anything to add on that one, Charlotte? No, not really, I, I agree, I think, you know, the fact that this is a, a new technology doesn't change the the principles and the obligations that we have. Um, you know, I don't think you know, a regulator, you know, be it consumer duty or GDPR or any any of this, um, you know, it's obviously not going to fly if we're like, oh, well, we, you know, it was the AI that made that choice, or you know, we, we were using that data for AI, so it's fine. Like, oh, of course not. It, we still have to be bound by all of the same principles. I guess explainability becomes quite important here, and I think that's where, so I guess this is where we, there's a difference between how we might treat like professional clients. So like, for example, in our capital markets business, we do offer a machine learning model as a, uh, um, as a trading tool, where the clients, if they're sophisticated enough, can use that directly, right? Again, we wouldn't offer this sort of thing to retail clients, because for a retail client, you need to be able to explain a decision in, in, a, in a human readable way, right? So you need to be able to say, you know, we sold this, uh, we reallocated your portfolio in this way because of these reasons. We can't say, oh, the model thought it was like 92% a good idea, right? So again, a, a lot of it really also does come down to uh, the client's level of understanding and what risk they are willing to take on. Okay. Um, one of the, the earlier panel sessions um, with uh, the group at the beginning was, was talking about um, embedded finance um, and embedded payments that maybe even in this room will be familiar, familiar with in their own sort of personal experience. Just thinking about the future of wealth management and AI adoption, um, how do you think that can transform the customer experience? I think, um, I guess I think this almost kind of links back to the first question. I think our sector in general, uh, unfortunately, has been far behind retail and many other sectors <laughs> in terms of, of digitization. A lot of that is unfortunately down to the fact that we were often, especially if you look at the older banks in the sector, we were often the first to adopt uh, technology. And because of that, we still are operating systems from the 80s where you know, something that might be a 50,000 pound digitization project for a, uh, you know, a 50,000 pound module for a fintech to build is 2 million for us because there's 1.7, you know, 1.8 million worth of uh, integration and various other bits of consulting in there, right? Um, so I think the, the opportunity this potentially gives us is A, uh, you know, as our margins continue to kind of to compress, we're able to digitize in a more cost efficient way, but also much more rapidly. So when it comes to kind of competitiveness as well, um, by using these tools, particularly when it comes to, you know, in developer productivity, we can hopefully take down those really long deliverables into something that um, you're delivering on a time frame that customers expect. I think what you often find, like when you talk to customers that have experience, have a good experience with fintechs, it's often that you know they give feedback and they see you know the rollout of a of a um, of a fix within you know like a month to two months, which is very very rare with large industry players. You do see it in some big players like Tesla, right? You know you complain about something to the CEO and then software updates gets pushed to the car, right? But again, that it goes uh, you know if you've got a if you've got a lean if you've got a lean and modern technology stack, you can do that sort of thing. AI is not going to be a magic bullet that's going to suddenly kind of, you know, ma you know magically transform all our backends, but it will help us, uh, you know, take a lot of that drudge work out along the way. Yeah, I, I mean, I think AI should, specifically LLMs, should represent a, a huge democratization of information um, and 
not just in wealth, but in loads of different areas, like you know, being able to access kind of um, you know legal information, not necessarily advice, but um, for people being able to arm themselves with maybe a level that I wouldn't necessarily call expertise, but I would call kind of a level of being informed. Um, and I think that for, for wealth managers, what I was saying before about you know helping to improve personalization, being able to kind of give give our clients information that's way more relevant for them, and even possibly in future being able to allow them to interact with their financial information in a much more kind of intuitive way rather than receiving some generic report that's quite you know difficult to to engage with from a kind of personal standpoint. Maybe you could even do it in a natural language interface. I don't know. That's great for wealth managers, but you know, we have a huge advice gap um, for people where it's, you know, it doesn't make financial sense to provide um, financial advice to them. But actually, this technology could help with that. Um, maybe not in the kind of high net worth area, making that, that sort of impact. But you know, lowering the cost to serve has got to be good. For, for that, so I think that that should be really helpful and empowering for wealth clients. I think it makes the service more accessible as well. So I think you know a lot of the issue in our sector is that you know we have a relatively high minimum because there is the service is relatively costly to provide. It's mostly human driven. We can actually lower that minimum and provide the same level of service if we're able to digitise effectively. It's it, it's really interesting the. Um, um, looking at social media and, and who next-gen investors are, are starting to pay attention to in terms of financial advice. It's on TikTok, it's on YouTube, it's on Snapchat, which is fascinating and terif terrifying all at once. And um, I mean, I, I'm a, I would say my attention span has certainly been impacted by things like WhatsApp and Instagram and reading long insight, market insight reports and then making decisions based on that and where we should put our savings, where should we, we should think about wh where our pension goes. Um, it's, uh, it's, a d it's a difficult one to, to think about. D just expanding upon you know, that customer experience element, do you, s do you start to see, um, and I like that term, the, the I can't say it, democratization of, of, um, of information, and I heard the term uh, citizen data scientist earlier on as well. Do you see that the idea of embedded advice elsewhere um, being enabled by, by, by AI? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, that, that point around people are increasingly consuming information from, from kind of non-traditional, like financial information from non-traditional sources. So, you know, people reading, you know, who are young, young, are they reading the FT or are they going on TikTok and seeing people talking about things? And I actually think that's a massive risk. Um, and I think it potentially only gets exacerbated by AI. You know, if you're, if you're a bad actor, um, in the same way that AI means that we can create personalized information for our clients with the best intentions, someone else is able to they potentially reach out to people to encourage them to make bad financial decisions in a very personalized way and a much more engaging way. And that, that's got to be a risk that we think about. Um, you know, before you even get onto things like using AI to create deep fakes and then suddenly you've got, I don't know, a deep fake of Warren Buffett telling you to go and buy some dig like dodgy cryptocurrency. Like we, we do all need to think about that as an industry and where this information is coming from. But I think... You know, people should not be using something like ChatGPT, which has been trained on a huge amount of data just from the internet to make financial decisions. However, using something like, like ChatGPT, but grounding it in trusted information, for example, like the reams and reams of information that, that we have internally about kind of macroeconomic thought leadership, or good investment processes, or all that kind of stuff. You know, if you can ground it in that sort of information that is held within the financial industry, then that could be incredibly powerful um, as long as it's trusted. 
because I think there's no way for you to get these models to, to tell them where they're sourcing this information from, like it's just in the model somewhere. So you, know, you, you don't know if ChatGPT tells you something, like where it's got that from, unless you are grounding it in a data source. So I think there's a massive opportunity there, but um, you need to be really careful about the, data, the reference data. Do I have anything to, to add to that? Um, I guess um, the, but without touching on to a kind of <laughs> what was going to be the topic of the next panel on personalization, right? Um, so there is a there is a great advantage, I think, as you know, following on from Charlotte's point on um, right now. So when we looked at how much time it took to develop a personalized proposition to an individual. Uh, using some automated data collection techniques, but mostly kind of manual. It took anywhere from between sort of four hours for a relatively kind of um, kind of low, someone with a relatively um, straightforward scenario. So, you know, maybe a, a couple of uh, like a, a employee provided stock plan and, you know, some like a basic pension to sometimes two days for or longer for like a, you know, a multi-generational family investments everywhere else, right? And a lot of that was just reading through, reading through information, understanding where things were, and then kind of, you know, most of it in our sector is presenting information in the right way, right? Um, generative AI in particular gives us the ability to absorb that information. Again, once you make it sure it's from a kind of a trusted source, but then generating uh, personalized narratives for each decision maker, in you know, in seconds versus you know that that massive you know um, massive effort that, that that we used to see before. So it goes back to Charlotte's point about potentially de uh, democratizing the service because that used to be you know those sort of work efforts used to be purely the um, you know only the ultra high net worth would get that. Now you know if you're able to take the cost of that down, you're able to provide it to a much wider group of individuals. So it, it is, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting, um, but I think we do have to, there are some significant risk issues that we need to uh, get comfortable with. Yeah, definitely a lot to think about. Um, just a reminder that there's an um, opportunity for you as the audience to ask questions through the, the app, and I'll actually jump to one of them now. I think we've, we've, we've touched on, on some of the themes for this question a little, but I think it's worth delving into. Um, do you see any major roadblocks in the adoption of AI? I think we've been talking about the risks and the need to ground the model in information that is trusted. I think that's a key one. Um, what other roadblocks do you do you do your teams have in mind when they're exploring this? Uh, legacy systems. Uh, again, kind of going back to the point I made earlier, it's not um, off. You know. AI is only as smart as the, the data and information you can feed into it. Um, and, you know, in a lot of organizations, uh, you know, we still have these issues where, you know, we were talking about data warehouses and big data, I don't know, it was like 10 years ago now, I feel, right? <laughs> but we still haven't implemented it in many places, right? And we still, you know, if you look across a lot of the kind of large players in our space, you'll still see batch processes that will bring you data from two days ago, right? So if you're able, you know, if you, when you're talking about kind of real-time personalization, providing real-time <laughs> insights, a lot of the data pipelines and infrastructure simply don't exist for this. So there's a lot of preparatory work that, that needs to happen. Um, that's, yeah, I think for me, that's that probably the, more than anything else, that's the biggest roadblock. <laughs> yeah, I think data is really, really key. Um, yeah, we, we quite often will have conversations with people where they're just like, oh, it's great, well, we'll just put all our data here and then we'll send AI after it and we'll, you know, it can answer any question that Schroeder's has that information. And yeah, it's just, it's just not, that's not how it works. And you know, if a human in our organization doesn't know how to get hold of the data they need in order to answer a question, like why would AI be able to, the cleverest AI agent in the world would not be able to, find it if it's not kind of, you know, documented and it, it has access to it. So yeah, data data is really, really key. And um, 
the desire to, to kind of leverage AI within our company has massively fed into kind of our data strategy and it becomes kind of a two-way conversation with the, with the data team. Um, and the, I guess the other one, which is, this is not an AI problem, this is a you know, change and technology adoption problem, is just, it's just time. You know, I think everyone was shocked when, you know, including OpenAI who built it, everyone was shocked by ChatGPT and the, the reaction to it and the excitement over what it can do. Um, no one last year was budgeting for, oh great, I'm gonna have all these AI projects up and running and oh, I'm gonna carve out my time to think about how it's gonna strategically impact my business. Like, no one planned for that. And it is really difficult in a, in a big company where you have a lot of really important in wealth, often regulatory driven projects. It, carving out the time to think about this at quite short notice and to try and keep up with a really fast moving landscape is, is a challenge. Um, and it's something that we've, we've kind of seen across the organization. And the only way to get around that has been for us to have really, really strong top down support and directives that you know, from our CEO that he wants people to take this really seriously. Yeah, I think the, the, key, the key thing for me is the understanding the implications and baseline and foundations of what you need to build this, this on, talking to the point of data. I don't think that's been fully grasped. And to your point, Charlotte, about let's just put it all in one place and AI will sort it. That's that's not that's not really gonna gonna be work gonna work. Um, I think I'll I'll look to open open up to the audience for questions in a moment. Just just a final question that's come in. Um, <clears throat> I think we've again we've touched on this a little during the course of the conversation, but um, and I know. None of you or I have a crystal ball, but long term, how do you see um, AI adoption fundamentally changing kind of wealth management, the relationship between clients and clients and advisors and firms? Are, what, what do you see? What do you see? I mean, I suppose this is almost horizon scanning, isn't it? It's a challenge, but what do you think? I'm going to steal what Charlotte said. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess the, the one thing I see is is wealth management, these sort of sophisticated wealth management techniques that ultra high net worth individuals benefit from. Uh, I see that being available. Uh, you know, with, I guess if we have full adoption of the systems that we that we kind of um, that we're kind of experimenting with today, we could potentially bring the threshold down to hundred thousand, maybe less, maybe a maybe a thousand pounds to get because you know. The, the big blocker right now is the amount of time and effort that people have to put in to provide this kind of service. If you're able to implement, you know, digitize, you know, the vast majority of it, you could, you know, probably not do all of it, but you could maybe uh, provide a large chunk of it to a, to a, uh, to the affluent segment. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think AI will be embedded um, in people's everyday roles. Um, there's not really a role at Schroeder's that I can think of that wouldn't benefit in some way from being able to use AI in their day-to-day -day tasks. Um, and I think it, it will become kind of just a ubiquitous tool. Um, I think the impact on wealth, definitely um, agree with you on, on the kind of that democratization and bringing down the cost to serve. And I think that, on, that only can benefit clients. Um, I think that there will still be humans involved. Um, but I think wealth managers need to think really carefully about what it is that they are bringing to the table, what's the value that they are bringing that can't be replicated by AI, and they need to double down on that. Um, because I think a wealth manager that, that doesn't adopt AI will not be able to compete in the future world. But I also think you know there is a role for advisors and wealth managers, and they just need to figure out kind of what, what does a client value that, that, that they do and um, that they really need a human to do? You potentially see a much higher sophistication in investment management once kind of a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks are sort of systemized. I think it's also quite instructive to look at technology adoption over the past sort of two, three decades, right? So it wasn't unusual sort of if you go back two, three decades where you wouldn't even do your own typing, right? You know, you'd write something up and hand it to a typist or you dictate it, right? Um, 
again, not that long ago, that you wouldn't even do your own presentations. You would, you know, pass it to a presentation team who would do it for you. Now, if those teams exist at all, it's usually to professionalize something that you've already done as opposed to kind of creating things from scratch. It's quite interesting to have a look at. So the um, the latest, um, I guess, GPT-driven add-on to Microsoft Teams where it literally summarize a meeting, you know, and then if you say in the middle of a meeting, oh, you know, this is an action point, it will then highlight that as an action point. So you can sort of see the, the the pace of progress. Look at looking at just what's been rolled out for general availability in the past month, but also looking at how we've progressed over the last couple of decades. Thanks, thanks, Mo. Um, we've got just just under five minutes left. I just wanted to give an opportunity for anyone in the room to to ask a question. Hi, um, thanks Bill for sharing your experience. Um, I guess my question is, obviously we are talking about adopting AI to um, increase efficiency and productivity, but in wealth management, obviously we know there are a lot of legacy processes and data, so the AI evolution, the speed of AI evolution has a gap um, to compare to the, you know, automating the legacy processes and systems in wealth management. So how do we make these two things in sync so that we can um, capture the benefits of AI evolution and then make sure we, are, we can realize the uh, maximum benefits from that into the, um, the kind of updated process rather than using AI to automate something that's not the best pro process. Thank you. I think I, I would say people probably need to be a little bit careful around not just thinking about this as another automation tool um, because it's actually something that can um, you know, if you use ChatGPT, I wouldn't say it's necessarily kind of automating things. It can do a lot, a lot more than that. Um, I think, yeah, completely agree with you. Legacy systems, data's a mess. <laughs> you know, there's loads of challenges. Um, but I think, you know, there are small things that that people can do kind of immediately. So, I mean, we have a, a internal AI assistant that we've built, which is powered by models including ChatGPT and GPT-4. Um, and it's kind of like having an internal version of, of ChatGPT that we can also, you know, people can put data into it and ask questions about the data that they've put into it um, as an assistant um, and do things like, um, you know, upload a meeting transcript and get your meeting actions and, you know, draft answers to questions that were asked and all that kind of stuff. And actually, just from that being kind of a, a user-driven tool, um, we don't need perfect data because it's actually within the control of the user. Like, they've got access to information, they can just put it in. Um, and that's given us kind of productivity gains just in people using it in their day-to-day -day tasks. Um, so I think if you want to kind of, you really, you know, at scale deploy AI all over your organization, then you know, that is kind of a huge task that I think you know, people kind of want to be thinking about. But there are also much smaller kind of actions that can be taken. And if you're addressing specific use cases, it's like what, the, what data do you need for that use case? If you want to use AI to help you um, answer RFPs, for example, Where's your RFP data? Where are your historical responses? Where's your thought leadership? That's quite contained, actually. So then you can take a look at that. Um, and I think within our investment areas as well, we have pretty well well organized data because we're already processing a lot of data there. So there's quite a lot we can do with with those data sources. So it's not that like everything in your organization has to be super well kind of structured because no one no one's happy with their data. No organization you talk to is happy. Um, but it's just about, you know, what are the use cases you can go after that actually have defined um, data sources and then you know, move, move, continue to move things along from a kind of data quality and management perspective as well. I would add that I guess the, the systems looking after your core processes have to be modern, you know, transactions, buying and selling securities, because otherwise, I think going back to the question you asked me earlier, that, that will be a roadblock. It reminds me actually of a, in a very different industry, you know, we, I, about 10 years ago as part of this philanthropy project, I'd w gone to southern Sierra Leone to look at a rice development uh, project. 
and it was in this area where they were using traditional farming techniques, but they were producing rice at a yield comparable to uh, big commercial farms in places like Thailand. And we were kind of, we were like, we were looking at it thinking, this is fantastic, why aren't they kind of exporting? And it turned out that the, um, and we saw it as we were traveling into that area, that the road was so bad, it wasn't even a road, it was like barely a dirt track. So the cost of transporting the rice from that highly productive area to Freetown, where you could get to a port and then ship it out, was so high that it became two or three times the cost of imported rice from Thailand. So again, it's, it's the same kind of issue that we see here, is that because we have so much data tied up in these legacy systems, unless we can sort out the infrastructure, there's no technology that we can throw at it that's gonna solve these fundamental problems. Thanks. Um, Unfortunately, we'd have to we'd have to end it there. On, um, we're at time, um, but I think we'll we'll all be around later on for for questions in the networking sessions. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists and thank um, thank everyone for participating today and also the questions. Thanks very much. I'll end it there. <laughs>